this group of Sumerian deities, these beings they call them, that they call them the Anuna and Sumer and Anunnaki in Assyrian and Akkadian. And what that word translates to mean is those who are from this realm or us came here. Some people be like, oh, wow, they come here in a spaceship, flying around space, and then they come to Earth. I don't think this is that way at all. I am probably one of the only researchers that has that opinion. If you learn about ancient Sumerian and the gods that are associated in stories, you find out that there are two very distinctive things. There are the forces of nature, and they're represented by like things like fire and storms, but they're depicted like beings. And it's really easy to be like, oh, so they're all that. Oh, they're all just like forces of nature and things like that, so that they're not real. Well, Matt, welcome back, dude. Been looking forward to this one. We obviously had a six hour marathon when we talked over the summer and put that out, and that had a lot of different responses to it. Right. But you have researched so many things that there's so much on the bone here. Obviously, you couldn't get it done in a couple podcasts. People have been asking for you back ever since. So here we are. Well, it's great to be back, Julian. I love our conversations. We had a blast last time. We did. We did. It was a lot of fun. And and the night before, I had Danny Miranda in town, as I had recorded with him <clears throat> as well, like the day before. I want to I want to go back to sure. this, though, because there was something that in my head I put a bookmark in maybe was it 20, this? 25 minutes ago. Okay. No. You mentioned the Anuna. Sure. In relation to to what we were looking which, at Which is here. what this is basically right here. Okay. Yes. So we had talked a bit about the Anunnaki. Which is the same thing. The Anuna is the Sumerian version. We had talked a bit about the Anunnaki yeah. last time, and we hadn't really gone all the way down into it. So if you don't mind, what I'd like you to do is give some people a refresher on what we think we know about them, where the origins are, etc. So the, Anun the Anunnaki or Anuna is of a very mysterious area to explore. It's one that has a lot of opinions from a lot of different people. And it's perhaps one of the most enigmatic of all concepts to think about. And I really mean that because the, when you read the tablets about what to, how they're described, it almost comes across as supernatural and fantastical. It's something where we have to look at it in a lens where like, so what are they then? To give people a little background before I read a little bit here, just to fill in the gaps, is that what we find before the Ararat civilization is that the original Sumerian civilization that came out of the Iraq area that I talk about with Eridu and then Shrupak is the last city, they discuss very extensively in the tablets this group of Sumerian deities, these beings they call them that they call them the Anuna and Sumer and Anunnaki uh, in Assyrian and Akkadian. And what that word translates to mean is those from above, those from heaven to earth came or those from above to earth came. It, it just basically those that, those who were from, were from this realm or us came here. They stayed, okay? And I, I don't want to label that as what a lot of people will jump on right now. Like some people will be like, oh, well, they, they come here in a spaceship. Are they like flying around space and then they come to Earth? I don't think this is that way at all. Now, I, I am probably one of the only researchers that has that opinion. I fall, why, what, I fall in a bit that? of a crack. Well, I fall in a bit of a crack because you, you either have researchers who are like all in and like all their physical beings at all these like technical tools and they came here and like space suits and right? You, people, people either go all in or you get academics to like, well, they're not actually real. They're forces of nature and the planets, and they're not actually anything tangible. So you get the extremes of both ends, okay? That's what you get. You get the extremes of both ends because it's interesting that if you learn about ancient Sumerian and the gods that are associated in stories, you find out that there are two very distinctive things. There are the forces of nature. And they're represented by like things like fire and storms, right? Storm gods and Adad is one of them, right? So, and, but they're depicted like beings, storms and forces of nature. And it's really easy to be like, oh, so they're all that. Oh, they're all just like forces of nature and things like that. So that they're not real. But then you get this whole other problem. And this is where... You get very few people like me that actually academically look at this in an open mind and study it. 
saying, well, there are forces of nature mentioned, but there's also ones that have complete conversations and have identities and have roles and do all these physical things and have all these things happen here. So what's going on right now? Well, in the ancient world, they believed that everything had consciousness. Everything. The sun, um, you know, the earth. They believe that the earth is a living being. They called it Gaia. They called it, um, there's different names. They called it Ki. K-I was actually one of the original names for earth, believe it or not. K-I. Who was calling it this? The, the, the uh, original, like some of the oldest tablets we have, like the Enuma Elish, um, they, they talk about it like that. But they say it in this very mysterious way where they talk about it in an ancient, ancient, ancient way where it's mysterious because it doesn't seem at all in even the time period of humanity. For instance, they talk about um, like planets colliding and th um, astronomical things occurring that they're like part of to – like creating an environment that's like the, they have all these they all have all these terms they talk about where they seem to be fighting against the natural elements to almost conquer them is what it is what it comes down as and it describes it as okay and it's very bizarre and I and I want to read two little passages here before I discuss any more so people don't think I'm totally crazy okay because okay. this is and again this is what it's it states and now the myth of Adapa that came from Translated in 1912 from R.W. Rogers, who originally came out of the Ashurbanipal Paul Library. I want to read this tiny little piece of the, the front, because I think it's going to blow your mind and anyone listening to Try this. Try me. Are you ready for this? Okay. It's called The Myth of Adapa. Okay, now Adapa, a lot of people believe as well, including me, that Adapa is the original name for Adam. What, on what basis the biblical do we Adam. think that? Well, listen, you ready? Okay. I'm reading direct quotes from the myth of Adapa. This is tablet one. He possessed intelligence, his command, like the command of Anu, God. He, Ia, who's, who is a Sumerian god named Enki or Ia, who's one of the patron Sumerian gods. He's supposed to be the creator of humanity, of mankind, according to the tablets. It says, he, Ia, granted him a wide ear to reveal the destiny of the land. Everything's cryptic. Think about everything for a minute in like a cryptic, symbolic way. He granted him vision, Adapa. He granted him vision, but he did not grant him eternal life. In those days, in those years, the wise man of Eridu, Ia had created him as chief among men. A wise man whose command none shall oppose. The prudent, the most wise among the Anunnaki he was. Blameless of clean hands, anointed, observer of the divine statutes. Try to wrap your head around that for a minute. It's saying in this that Anu, that, that Adapa was created perfect and that he was even more wise than the Anunnaki. It says the prudent, the most wise among the Anunnaki he was. So wait a minute, think about that for a second. It's saying that Adapa, who's a human, He's considered a great sage. If you read other tablets, it talks about how he's considered a sage who was part of the Upkalu, who traveled around the world to teach. Okay, that's what he was. He wasn't a king, he was a sage. And it says here that he's the most wise among the Anunnaki. Wait a minute. So he's an Anunnaki? So what does that mm. make us? It starts to unveil layers to try to understand this. Now let me read one more little piece to, to even expand this further. This comes from the legend of Atana, which is another set of tablets after the flood when they re-lowered kingship again during the same time as the Ararat civilization, I believe. It says here, they planned a city. The gods laid its foundations. They planned the city of Kish, the first city after this deluge in Iraq. So, same time period though, okay? The Ajiji founded its brickwork. Let him, Atana, be the people's shepherd. Let Atana be their architect. The great Anuna gods, ordainers of destinies, sat taking their counsel concerning the land. The creators of the four world regions, establishers of all physical form. So those are two completely different tablets that discuss the Anunnaki in 
mysterious ways and also that we are basically them. So what does that mean for a minute, right? Do we have any ar- archaeological evidence of Anunnaki? We have more than you could ever imagine. I mean, literally of... Right, the, the, the Ashurbanipal mural, uh, no, no, countless no, 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 others. No, 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 Is there any... Are there any weird remains found that could point to them being Anunnaki remains, for example? Well, human remains don't last very long, first of all. And secondly, I think we're looking in the wrong place. I think we need to look at the ancient lineages of some of these kings and why they lived for so long and ruled for so long and why so many mysterious people like Methuselah, Book of Enoch and and uh, and Enoch himself, they just constantly describe it as them living like six, seven, eight hundred years or more, like in in so many yeah. different places yeah, too. You not about that. not just like the Sumerian and stuff, right? It's from a, it's from Hebrew text, Gnostic text, Sumerian text, Babylonian text, Egyptian. It echoes this concept that we used to be something that we're different now. We used to be taller. We used to live a lot longer. We used to have connections that we don't seem to have any longer. And that's, I think, the whole point of the stories I read you with the flood on how the Noah figure was preserving some kind of a seed of mankind. Because I think it's what divided us from being more animal-like. So if we think of what means to be homo sapien sapien, and these this, these connections we have and who we are, I it, it has come to the attention of a lot of people, and it's the possibility that that bloodline is what disseminated to create the gifts in what we are today. But what it gets back to what we originally read, because it says that Adapa was the wisest among the Anunnaki, which means that we are the Anunnaki. And what what's interesting about that, though, is that we are mysterious and we have all these gifts and we're powerful. But we, it seems like we don't remember any of it. And we have only bits and pieces. Like, if I'm going to go, give an example. This is really easy. Everybody knows this. If I'm going to go call you and I pick up the phone and I'm like, God, I got to call Julian Dory. I got to set up another podcast, right? And I'm like about to call and I put the intention out there. I'm going to call Julian Dory. You're really going to do it. You can't play with it. This is how it works. You can't be like, oh, I might do that. If you set your intention on something, like I'm going to do this and you pick up the phone, you're going to do it. A lot of times the person on the other end, and I know this happens to a lot of people, they'll be like, whoa, why did I just get a thought of Julian Dory in my head? And then the Mm. phone rings and then it's you calling or me calling, vice versa, right? Yeah, the weird subliminal messaging. What are you doing there? What's happening there? Break that down for me. I think about that a lot. It's because we have telekinesis. We have gifts within our mind and energy, within our consciousness that are not fully unlocked and understood. It's like we forgot all those things, and then we're trying to remember them and unlock them again like they're dormant within us. All right, bring this back to Anunnaki now. Well, we seem to have had all these divine gifts, and and we were this certain type of individual, and it's discussed how it was almost some, – some texts like the Book of Enoch consider like the Nephilim, like the cross between them and giants. They call them like an abomination. It gets into this concept and idea that we were created based on like the Noxic text, like the Nag Hammadi scriptures. If anyone who reads that, the secret book of John, it describes how this creator being in there is, is jealous of us and uh, discusses how it, it's, it wants to throw us, this powerful being, which I think is one of the Anuna. It wants to throw us into like the, it says the lowest form of matter as like a punishment for us. Um, because there's a jealousy in inherently in who we are. But go back to that I just read. Remember, I just said, a wise man, the prudent, the most wise among the Anunnaki he was. What that means is that we were created to potentially be greater than them. I think we are them. I think there's even a possibility they're somehow related to us in the future. But you're saying a DAPA is human, but more the connotation there is that he's more perfect than the Anunnaki. Which is where the jealousy came in originally, because it's saying that we were created, which is the Adam and Eve story. Which would mean they're human, though, too. No, which means we're them. Yes. Right. Yes, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. 
Okay. But I don't. So there's no separate. That's what okay. I was trying to get. So at. what there's are no they? Separation. Let's get let's get down to the core of what they are. Then okay. I think they're us, but like a million times more advanced. I don't. Th- what you like, for instance, let me give you an example. George Smith, the greatest translator in history, that literally cracked the Sumerian code. He wrote a book called the Chaldean Account of Genesis, and in that book, he summarized his entire life study. It's literally his life's work. And, he, and at the end of the book, he has a conclusion where he summarizes as someone who's read more tablets and studied more than anyone else in the world. And he summarizes on his thoughts about the Anunnaki. It's really wild, actually, at a time when academics would never even touch it or talk about it. And this is the 1800s. Maybe that's why he was able to do it. I encourage anyone to read the very end of the Chaldean account of Genesis, and I've saved it and highlighted it all in my, in my book, but, and I read it all the time. But he basically says that the only thing that makes sense to him about the Anunnaki is that they come back, backwards. He says this words exactly. He says, they seem to come backwards and forwards in time, in, our, in, our, in, in Earth's time, for specific reasons. What did he mean by that? That's all he says. And he goes on to say that he doesn't necessarily believe the king's list because they're too long and it's like beyond our comprehension to How add would they it up. come backwards and forwards unless they were tra- Time traversing the multi? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. So now we're getting into where I really think we need to go because we need to stop thinking about what like alien ships and little gray aliens and stuff. Let's stop doing that. Let's yeah, tra- but, yeah, but hold on. Back up for a minute. Okay. This and time travel is all a hypothetical I know. theoretical physics. I, I know that, right? Yeah, I know. But when I listen to some of the greats who look at this, I, I, I try to relate their concepts and make sure that I'm going off of some of that because right. I'm not a physicist. Yeah, me so, like, let's, I, I'm not let's either. use a guy we both like, Michu Kaku. I love Michu. Michu talks about like the rivers of time, right. So, meaning the best example, I've used this a ton on the podcast, so apologies for repeating. But he says, for example, if you went back to April 19 or 1865 to try to stop the assassination of Lincoln and you stop John Wilkes Booth from doing right. it, you are not changing the multiverse reality that you came from. You are creating another loop yes. that is, that is a, an estuary from that river, yes. if you will. Right. For a different reality. So when we talk about within this reality, you and I are allegedly sitting in together right now. Right. If the Anunnaki are traveling forwards and backwards, when they're traveling backwards, they're affecting other realities that we're not in right now. They talk about it too. They talk about but it. But would, why would we be talking about it in this reality if we didn't? You see what I'm saying? Well, I, I totally understand. I think it comes to karma. It was loops right back to our discussion earlier about karma. In the Atrahasis, there's this bizarre line. The Atrahasis is the is the the Noah figure who actually that's his he it's his set of tablets. He has his own set of tablets called the Atrahasis. My favorite set of tablets of any of them. And I would consider them the most important of all the tablets. The Atrahasis. In that is the most peculiar line, and I can say it off my head because I know. I don't have to read it. There's the most peculiar line of anything ever said in any tablet. Like peculiar, and it ties in exactly what you just said. It says in there, Enki, and en- Enlil's talking to Enki. They're both Sumerian. They're both these powerful two uh, deities that seem to be very much in charge in part of our reality and our history. They seem to be like this is Enlil right here. His name's Haldi or Haldi. I can't say Haldi. that. I can't. I'm not going to say that's going to hurt my throat every time. But um, we'll use a soft age. Um, it's the same thing. Now, what he says in that is he says. Enki, where you went, and you can find out where he went through the legend of Atana, he went in the underworld. Remember, Saudi Arabia with all those inverted step pyramids, the doorways? He said, where you went, I want you to think about this for a second before you say anything. It said, Enki, where you went, you were to undo the chain and set us free. I kid you not, it says that. Word for word. And what's your connotation with that? Well, why would you be, what's a chain? Like, okay, so a chain is like you're stuck to something, right? Yes. Right, okay. Uh, why, what would you need to undo it for? Why are you chained in the first place? Well, I think, it, I mean, I'm drawing the parallel okay. to what we see in all kinds of religious texts. Like, let's look at the Bible with Adam, who we were just talking about a minute ago with, with Adapa. The chain is, is the unknowing. 
right? But then he Look. gets unchained when he eats the apple, but then pays for it, and now he's imperfect as a sinner, right? What if the chain's time? What? Stay with me for a second here. What okay. if the chain represents time? Okay? Now, what if George was George Smith was spot on? He was right. I mean, the Numa Illich speaks to them being here before we were ever here. It's something about like proto-Earth. Seriously, read it. Um, it's called the, tab- the Seven Tables of Creation. If he, what if he's right? What if they did come backwards and they did things? What you just said is beautiful. If you go back, think about what you just said. If you go back and you alter something in the past, it doesn't change the future. You create an all alternate timeline. Yes. Which means you screw around with karma. Because you are then altering what was supposed to happen. You then be bound you then become bound to it. Unless now we're getting real metaphysical right, here. Right. Unless each of those new creations creates the other ends of the multiverse that your karma will take you to as yourself or maybe someone else in the next life. That's happening yes. simultaneously. Okay. Okay. You see what I'm saying? But why would he say where you went? Because we know where, where did Enka go? Legend of Tana, Tana very clearly states he goes in the underworld. He becomes one of these yeah. rulers in the underworld as a positive counterpart. So you have a positive and a negative and a negative and a positive. It's like the, it's the hermetic law. You have there, That's the way everything seems to be, just so you know. is There seems to be like the underworld is not just a neg- evil there's a there's a war there's a there's a demon like being in the underworld that is called Nergal, and it is playing the role of death and destruction and war. Nergal. His name is Nergal. N e r g a l. Yeah. You okay. He's a demon like. Yeah, he plays the role of like a demon here. Where is he first seen, and what we know, like what the, what you see is that Nergal. Yeah, you find on the tablets that there were four Anuna, four. Again, there's a totality of two and two above and below that assume different roles within our reality. That's what they describe them as. And so when there he is right there. So when and I believe Nergal was known as was God is known was known as God El in the Maya, which was like a corrupted blood sacrifice type of influencer. That's nice. Well, no, but imagine they're all playing roles, just distinctive roles within the duality of existence. Okay, and imagine that 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 being is playing extremely like he's playing the negative, the bad, the bad guy, right? Well, Enki was supposed to go in the underworld to play the positive counterpart to him. That's what the tablets describe him as, is playing a pos- positive counterpart to Nergal at, in the underworld. So it's like, it's like there's like this balance that exists that we don't understand, okay, with, with, with these concepts. Now, that's where Enki went. The, the reason I'm trying to say that is we know he, that's where he was sent to. But the tablets described him as being tricked. Mm. It describes as being tricked to do that and then being stuck there and that – when he says, Enki, where you went, you were supposed to undo the chain and set us free. My theory on that, based on everything I've looked at, is that the Anuna came back in time and altered our future and screwed up their karma and became bound to it. They got stuck here. They couldn't leave. That's why they're all throughout history and, they, and, they're, and they're so involved is that they got stuck in our realm and they literally, there's cosmic laws that I think prevent certain things. Wait, how do we, all right, are, are we making too big of a stretch there? Like how do I'm, we even know I, these I am, cosmic okay. laws if we're limited by our own understanding of physics, which is still extremely limited? We, there's, you know Sherlock Holmes, right? The famous fake, fake character that's based no on- Oh shit, Sherlock. Obviously, right? <laughs> um, the famous quote from that, right? When you're trying to figure something out, no matter, this is a blanket statement, and I think anyone should use this no matter what in life. Once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. Well, there could be a lot that remains. Well, but what, but what do you, what are we knocking out? We know they're not here in spaceships. We know that because we look at the depictions, they're us. They look exactly like us. We know, we know a lot of things, actually, but we just need to put them together. Like, look at that being right there. That doesn't look like some gray alien. It's us. She's got a hat on and wings. And it's the same yeah. thing. Eyes, nose, mouth, right. chin, but, neck. Yeah. But they... 
It's a nice hat, though. But they seem to be intricately connected to our future and, and our destiny, which is why they call themselves the ordainers of destinies. And they seem to be in, 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 deeply integrated into in the paths that certain individuals take here. And, these, and they, for instance, the Epic of Gilgamesh is a great one to identify, is that he goes on this, this journey to find immortality, and they talk about how he's, um, he, they get his attention, and then they start like assisting him on his journey. So there's a lot of things going on here, but the ramifications are that I think our reality is really complicated, and I think that it's, we're part of something far greater than we understand, and that these ancient sites and these depictions are all trying to tell us about that mysterious origin, about who we truly are, and about how far our past goes. And this entire game here is so that we can try to forget it and then find our way back. Why would, why would the Anunnaki not want us to know about them? Is it a part of the game to you to find our way back? There's, so they so they place humans in our way who just question stuff like this and say, "No, it must be bullshit," and therefore make everyone else accept that as mainstream. Is that, am it, I going it, too far down the conspiracy rabbit hole here? It may be more that the Earth is an important incarnation place for souls. A what? Incarnation place for souls. All right, in English, not Japanese. Meaning that, let's say, based on energy, that energy never, never be, never destroyed. Right? It can never be created. It can only change shape. Uh -huh. Right? So energy is eternal forever. Yeah. Meaning that if our consciousness is just purely energy, then we have, we were, we're eternal beings. But that doesn't mean that the soul is the same level of development as another soul. When you get in, you really get in to look at it, and like especially like Hindu texts, you learn that there are levels of souls here. Some are kind of new, figuring things out. Like and others are old, like old souls that have been and done this many, 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 many times, right? And we're all here for different reasons. How do you determine what's new and what's old? Well, I mean, who's, who you'll have that? someone who's just inherently wise, very mature for their age, very like balanced. They seem, they're like really different than other people. They seem like they have knowledge that's really profound. And there's right, some- but, but what if they, what if they were born into a broken household? Their dad was an alcoholic. They had to take care of their mom. Totally. And they were self-educated. They had 140 IQ. And then suddenly they learned all these lessons at age 10 that no one else had to. And by the time they were 18, they'd already been a father to their younger siblings. And so they're wise at 25. Oh, that's obviously a factor. But what about like what we carry from other lifetimes? There, there wouldn't be a purpose of us do, mm. doing it over and over again if we didn't bring something back. What's the point? What's the point? The point is, it's like a game. I think the game is that we come here and forget everything and don't know anything. And then look, look, we're in this world where it's like the Truman Show, where it's like kind of fake. And we're like, eh, this is kind of weird, right? Yeah. I don't know. But that's what's so beautiful about it. It's like, can you take this divine being that doesn't know anything about who it is anymore and has been controlled through war and other mechanisms, can it somehow, through the unexpected, somehow make it? Like, it's, it seems like an amazing movie. That's the only way I can describe it is if, like, so for instance, if you're like a, if you're powerful, if you're like omnipotent, you can do anything you want, you're the greatest thing you would be afraid of would be bo being bored. Mm -hmm. Being bored is literally like the most horrible thing you could ever imagine for anything because it would be like being in hell, like religious term hell, right? So what you would have to do is you would have to create entertainment like we do. And the entertainment, though, you would not be able to know the outcome because what's the point of watching a movie if you already know what's going to go, right? The point of a movie is that you watch it and you get grabbed into the story and then a lot of times something unexpected will happen at the end. You're like, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. That's, a, that's amazing, right? I didn't expect that to happen. I think that's our story. I think it's playing out like it's, it's supposed to, right? Think about our story for a minute. What is our story? Well, if we take the ancients and all the evidence we have, we were somehow divinely created in the universe as some kind of powerful being. There was jealousy then that arose over it. And then we were almost destroyed in some catastrophe that was created only for us to barely survive. 
and then the seed of us to carry on and we rise up to become this powerful golden age civilizations that are creating temples and pyramids only to be destroyed by a catastrophe and to forget nearly everything and have to start over again. Then, God damn, every time you need humans who survive too. And then all of a sudden, at, at all costs, when mm -hmm. it seems like the most impossibility of all things coming out of things like World War II with, and then the Cold War with nuclear weapons that can just annihilate all of us, what happens? We somehow make it. Mm. What a beautiful story. It is. And I think that our story truly is the greatest story ever told, and maybe that's the point. Maybe. I mean, that's where it gets weird for me, too, because... We had talked last time about the underground system. What what civilization was that in Turkey? Darren Kuyu. Darren Kuyu. Yeah. Where they had the shafts, basically. Yeah. And you said this could Living be, underground. Yeah, yeah, this could be ca catastrophe proof. Yeah. They could have lived down here for hundreds of years. As, exactly. Right? So every time we've had these catastrophes, if, if let, let's say Lawrence Krauss is in the ballpark when he says somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000 years ago, something like that is when we separated from the ape gene. And I, I would say he's, he's more on track than most, right. for sure. So either way, 100,000, yeah, right. 150, who the fuck Yeah, it? whatever. It's the same deal, One, right? two, somewhere in there. Right, somewhere in there. All the, all the catastrophes that have happened since then, humanity as a species, as an organism needed to survive. I it right. couldn't be like the Tasmanian devil where the right. last one was in whatever it was, 1933 right. or something. Yeah, yeah. Like they're gone. Mm -hmm. You know, hopefully we're able to recreate that with some science here, but assuming Poor that Dodo, hasn't, right? right? Poor Dodo. Poor Dodo. But, you know, if we, each one of those times people survived, think about how advanced civilization got. Yes. And then these few, whether it's, I mean, if it's 10... You know, well, there I, was definitely indigenous that were they were surviving too. So it's not just them, right? Yeah. But and again, and based on where they are in the world and the lack of or the communication that may have been able to occur based yeah. on whatever technology was that maybe we don't know about. Let's say like right now. Here's the best way to put it. Right now, the world ended, and the three of us, along with ten other people like us from America, maybe we'll keep it on the same country. Okay. Survived. Mm -hmm. Think about all the stuff we know. All the stuff sitting in here right now, the mm -hmm. technology we're aware of. Yeah, compared to them not knowing anything. Right. right. And I, none of us are engineers right. in this case. We can't so, recreate it. We only right. know about it. So we only know about exactly. it. Exactly. How would we teach our kids and make them understand if we can't turn it on? We probably can't. So once no. a generation gets maybe two generations away, they're at they're, – maybe they're not at zero. Right. They're not at zero because there's some sort of human understanding that's been passed on that they're now going to create and create new texts and new stories yeah. like their own Bible, yeah. if you will, or their own ancient Sumerian ta yeah. tablets, if you will. They're still at a at a birthplace point. Right. How many times might that have happened? I think it's happened two to three times. And I that think, is wild, And what's man. what's crazy about it, though, is that our story could have ended just like that. Um, and every time it doesn't, I don't think we're supposed to disappear. Why? Well, because we're connected to them. Our, our, looks like our karma, that chain, remember? I think our future is intertwined with theirs. We are them. They are us. We are part of and something. where are the, where were they from? That's the question. That, and you start, when you start trying to figure that out, it gets really, really deep because I don't think... We or they are what most people, even that study it, are. And now let me give you my conclusion that I've had to come to, and it's really difficult to come to this. But again, like that quote I just told you from the Sherlock's home, home quote, the only thing that makes sense when you eliminate all the other ones that don't is that look at, look at how angels and demons are described in later religions, okay? Right? They're sort of like helping, some are bad, whatever. Mm -hmm. We see that context throughout the world, this idea of like angels and demons influencing our, our, our reality, right? They describe in all the tablets as coming here and creating everything. They don't, they don't say they came and found like earth, like a, like a beautiful place. No, actually the complete opposite. They talk about coming here and fighting against the natural, the natural forces that were like out of control. Like imagine an earth that had gone through different events and for like maybe a, 
you know, thousands and thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, whatever it was, imagine a planet that was like no life, volcanoes going off everywhere, just like a- like a, And they tamed it? A, yeah, imagine a planet like Venus or something, or, you know, not having a, a physical, a terrestrial planet though, but they, that's the only thing that makes sense, like if you read the Enumal Ish and, and others, like with George's clip, with uh, Chaldean account of Genesis, I told you, backwards and forwards- um, George Smith, it's like they're somehow related to creation in the universe. Let that sit with you for a second. Imagine there's a there's a prime creator. Okay, this is how they describe it in in the tablets. Imagine there's a prime creator that it's like the underbelly of everything, the the, the golden ratio, the balance of nature and harmony, and they describe that as being God. That's what God is to them is nature. In the balance of in everything, right? Well, in in the in the Christian texts and other ones, they just they talk a lot about creation, though, right? And people are like, oh my god, you're a creationist? That's insane, right? I'm not a creationist. I'm, I'm trying to explain something, though. The way that they say it in every time, there's only one way they say it is they describe it as more like manifesting, manifesting things here, mm. right? That's what they describe it as, like they can just create whatever they want. And that maybe the reason why we're so powerful and why I can have a thought to call Julian Dory and why Julian Dory all of a sudden has that thought in his head is because we are creators too. We just don't know it. 